I ended up writing like what amounts to a love note to money to put language to this idea of treating money as if it was a partner that I wanted to have back and not just want to have back, but like want to recommit to building an amazing future together with. I wrote down, I want to hang on to you. I want to make room for you to grow. I wrote down, I want to see the best in you. I wrote down that I don't want to make assumptions based on small amounts of evidence. Doesn't sound like any relationship. I don't want to make assumptions based on small amounts of evidence. I want to see your potential and not bring past trauma into the relationship. I'm talking about money, not your partner here. I want to see your potential and not bring past trauma into the relationship. I commit to working on my own past trauma. I want to set you up for growth. I want to stop the behavior on my part that is sabotaging your success. This is Impact, the podcast where we explore entrepreneurship, mindset, and health to provide you with the ingredients for an unregrettable version of your life story. The DNA Company is an innovative provider of functional genomic solutions for personalized health and wellness. With over two decades of research, 10,000 plus genomic samples, including my own, and thousands of clinical consultations, Their reports can identify outcomes like chronic fatigue, dysregulated hormones, poor emotional resilience, addictions, chronic inflammation, metabolic dysfunction, weight gain, and more. Discover how the DNA Company's genomic insights can help your patients improve their health outcomes. Right now, as an exclusive offer to listeners, get $100 off DNA360 test and report by going to thednacompany.com forward slash impact lives. I had a patient once who came to me looking to improve his overarching health. And in that initial visit where we sat down across from each other, I asked him, you know, is there anything else you want to share with me? And this individual who was sitting across from me clearly would have benefited from changing his body slightly. He was very overweight. It was why his knees were hurting. It was the source of his inflammation. It was the elephant in the room in our conversation. And he said, yes, you know, before we get into this, I also just want to acknowledge my obesity. And I said, okay, that's great. Let's talk about that. And in that acknowledgement, he shared with me, he's like, I just want you to know, so you understand what you're working with, I won't be able to lose weight. And I was really curious about that. I said, tell me a little bit more about that. What do you mean you won't be able to lose weight? Again, he didn't come to me with weight loss as a primary concern. He wanted to shift all these other metrics. And it was in, in you know my clinical lens. And I'm very mindful here that uh, as clinicians, we have historically had this propensity to be like, oh, someone's overweight. That must be the cause of all of their problems. So the context I want you to understand here is we've done a thorough intake. It was the elephant in the room, we weren't talking 10 pounds, we were talking 40 to 60 pounds overweight. And so he said to me, he's like, Dr. Megan, I will not be able to uh, lose any weight, it is genetic. And I asked him to share more of this with me. And he said, you know, my mom is overweight, my aunt is overweight, my sister is overweight, we're all overweight, we've been told forever, it's genetic. So I just want you to know before we have any conversations about addressing things that may impact uh, weight loss for me, I want you to know it's very triggering for me because I won't be able to lose weight and it's disheartening. And so uh, we need to work around that. This was a really interesting moment for me. In my clinical career, I had never worked with someone who wasn't able to lose weight. The question was, why weren't they able to lose weight? And what did we need to do to address the underlying concern? I was also not aware, and while we have fat genes and other things that that shift how we metabolize and how we register in our brains, whether or not we are feeling satiated, there isn't a genetic profile that predicts obesity. And that's not what this episode is about. But I want you to hear what was happening with this individual. It didn't matter what I was going to throw at him with respect to this conversation about weight. He was so sternly planted in his belief that this could not happen to him. That me saying to him, well, maybe we can do it differently, or let's just try this, or any approach where we were looking at weight as a primary intervention was not going to work. 
And so I did exactly what he asked. I worked around it. I started to address lifestyle uh, interventions that would support inflammation, that would support other outcomes that we were looking for. I was inadvertently going through a back door. I never called out that weight piece again. I just started to chip away at it through different means. And what happened over the course of six months of he and I working together is I started to see this shift in him. Physically, he was losing weight. And finally, he reached a point where he said to me, you know, I'm trying to understand, I genetically am not supposed to be losing weight. And yet this is happening. Like, can you explain to me what is happening on this like DNA level that I'm like cracking the code? And what I shared with him was that what was holding him back from losing weight was his ardent belief that it wasn't possible for him. When we used the exact same techniques and labeled them something different, he opened his mind to the possibility that could happen. This was my opportunity to share with him, to the best of our knowledge at this point, there is not a single gene or genetic profile that will predispose you to obesity. That in fact, what we needed to do is unlock the code to increase your own metabolism, a code that may be available to other people in your family, but a code that really is only available to you when you are ready to access it. Once we were able to get there, once he was able to see evidence that maybe he wasn't predestined to be in a particular state of health for the rest of his life. His entire story he told himself around what was possible for his health started to change. The end of the story, if we can jump there, is that within 18 months, this individual had completely transformed his health. He had lost the weight that he needed to lose as a byproduct of making different choices in his life. And most importantly, he shifted a series of presuppositions that had been holding him back in his life. I share this story because if this isn't a struggle for you and you hear this from the outside, you're like, oh, I can can totally see how if you believe that it might hold this individual back. At the same time, if you're not this person experiencing this, this story and this emotional state, it's easy for you to say, oh gosh, like, of course he just needed to lose weight. Of course, that is just a story. Of course, it's just so obvious to me who's not him. I share this because In the world of how we manage money, and I've talked about this a lot, the parallels in psychology around how we manage money and how we manage our health, we hold ourselves back by categorizing ourselves and telling ourselves stories about where we are versus those other people, what is possible for us versus those other people. And when it comes to achieving a future outcome, losing weight, building wealth, the part of our brain that protects us from putting in too much effort only to be disappointed, it is fully lit up in both of these paths. And so while this conversation today is not about losing weight, and this conversation is about shifting our relationship with money, I wanted to start with a parallel story. I wanted to share with you the story of this gentleman who started to change his mindset and suddenly shifted what he thought was possible for himself. And so what we're going to go through in this episode today on a piggyback of my conversation around uh, financial leadership and burnout, I wanted to just speak to some resources, some things that you can do to grow from here where we left off last week. So I want to talk about six things you can do today to start to shift your relationship with money. And just like your relationship with healthy relationship with weight, this is an investment in a future state. So what's not going to happen in 30 minutes is we are not going to completely transform your financial state. But what we are going to do is shift the mindset pieces so that you are open to making different decisions. And when you make different decisions and align them with different actions, you get a different outcome. That's just the way building a future state works. If you don't believe your actions are actually going to warrant any kind of outcome, for you, you're not going to take them in the first place. And so we have to shift that belief system. And to shift that belief system, what we really need to do is we have to lift the veil on the story. So I talked about this in 2022, this idea of quantum wealth. And the first thing we need to do, and this is going to be the heavy lifting of the entire conversation, because the rest of the six are going to be quick. The first thing we need to do is we need to understand what your origin level is all about. Now, if you're like, what is she talking about? And where are we going? And where can I read more about it? This is my own framework. Other people have written about money and they've written about leadership and there are similar frameworks. I'm not going to claim this is like some 
massive, insightful shift the world download. This is just how I have categorized where people sit with respect to money. And if I want you to imagine this as a triangle, and inside the triangle, there are are four levels, the bottom level of the triangle, again, talked about this before. And if you're driving, you're not going to draw this out. And if you're visual and drawing it out, let's do this. The bottom level of that uh, triangle is the win work windfall level. It probably could use a better name, but we're hang- you're like in the raw creation of this uh, this mindset framework. The work win windfall level. And the thing you need to understand about your level, your origin level, is that moving up to the next level, it's always moving up to the one just above your origin that is the hardest. Once we can get through that barrier, like think of that barrier as being thicker than everywhere else. Once we get through that barrier, things can come to you easier. But that initial barrier, that's where we have to like strip off the our origin stories around money. You know, if you were told something as if it was completely true when you were six years old, you're like, my dad told me that when I was six. And like, it was gospel truth. That's a really hard truth to undo. Even if people throw all sorts of new adult evidence at you, you're still like, gosh, like, I really have believed this since I was six. It's going to take a lot to undo that. That win, work, windfall level. What I want to talk about in each of these is I want to talk about the core thinking trap that defines that. The core thinking trap that defines that win, work, windfall level is that money comes from other sources. Money comes from work. Money comes because I won it in a lottery or money comes because I inherited it. And if those things don't happen for you, it is, it's like you just can't see that there are any other ways that money may come into your life. And even if you, someone showed you if that person down the street's like, oh my gosh, I've been selling like Avon products and it's changed my life. What your brain immediately does until you're open is it moves into that second thinking trap where you go, I'm not like them. Oh, she could do that, but I can't. Let me tell you the story. Why? I can't lose weight. Let me tell you the story why, right? So we go into that story state. I'm not like them. We do the I'm not like them when we see people who are wealthy and we're kind of resentful of it. We're like, I'm not like them. See that look? She shot that person back there. She must be evil, right? We create all sorts of stories. I'm not like them. And the more we say I'm not like them without actually understanding what they are like, we like encase ourselves in the energy of the work win windfall vibration. And it is a vibration. And it's a really disempowering vibration, frankly, because you have no control over your financial destiny. So we're going to talk about some action steps, but I just want you to feel the energy of each of these levels. Now, there is a level below this. And I want to acknowledge this before we move on. The level below this is actually where we sit in money shame. Money shame is like, you may live in the household of win work windfall, but you are even more disempowered by it. This is where you might be in a win work Windfall, gosh, I need a shorter, that's like really hard to say. I need a shorter name for this. Uh, you might be in a in a family where this is currently the dynamic that's taking place. And not only is this dynamic taking place, but you're not allowed to see the bank accounts or you've never been given access to them or you've never been part of a financial discussion or you don't even know what to ask or you've been told your whole life that people with money are super bad and you don't have any level of empowerment around your money or maybe you're not working All of the above puts us in a state of money shame. Now, you might have grown up in a really wealthy family, can't manage your money, and you have money shame. You might have had one bad encounter with someone who happened to also have money, and the encounter may or may not have been about money, and you've decided to hang out in money shame. You might have had high expectations around what you could do with your career or your credential, but you've only been able to amass debt, not build out your business and it's moved you into a state of money shame. I want to say this because money shame is is a vibration that can jump up higher. It will always immediately once we unlock that jump to its sort of layer of origin. So if you have money shame, but you grew up in the layer above work, win, windfall, which is make and keep. When you clear that shame, you get to jump back to that origin level. I want to acknowledge that because there are some of you who are kind of caught in this box even below all of 
this. Things have happened to you over the course of your life that has put you in a place where you're like, I don't even want to look at money. I don't want to acknowledge money. I see money and everything falls apart. And so when we get into two through six of the things that we can modify and start to address, I want you to know all of these are created for you because money shame is a vibration I don't want anyone to hang out in. And money does not want to go hang out in more shame. It is going to be very challenging for you to put in tangible tactics and strategies to acquire money or emotional, spiritual strategies, attracting and manifesting to bring money in. If you're hanging out in money shame, it is like you are in solitary confinement of no money. So I want you to feel what that vibration feels like. So we've got shame below. Now it's starting to look like a Christmas tree. It's like a little box upon which my triangles are sitting that lowest level work, win, windfall, meaning money comes from other sources. Above that is that layer I call make and keep. This is where we've like had a success. Maybe you like worked corporate, like it was very successful for you. And then you switched and decided to become an entrepreneur. And you're like, holy shit, this is a totally different ball game. Or maybe you are an entrepreneur and you did one launch and it went not well, not well. Oh my gosh, it was so good. And what's your core belief here? Oh, it was a fluke. It only happened once. And so what do we do? We move into hoarding status. When money is left just to the management of, uh, I'm going to call them newspaper advisors. So like the people who will like read all the advice they could possibly look at with respect to uh, money and they find little tools to be able to make it and then they kind of hoard it and keep it. They've got money, but they won't spend it. They've got money, but that I think one of the terms we use is like, they're just really cheap. They're stingy. That's the make and keep energy. And the challenge with make and keep energy, and I gave you an extreme example, is that there's no fluidity of money. It's like we've got this box and then we we close it in. And when we close it in, we're in the box. And like you could see me right now, my body language is literally closing in. When we close in and we are like in that little box, I made it and I'm going to keep it and hang it on tight. What also does when we're in that body language and we're like hanging on tight to it is we also shut off any creativity or proclivity towards taking any type of risk with money. And I don't mean risk as in let's bet it all. I heard there's this really cool thing we should all we should all invest in. Let's all go in for Shopify. Let's all let's store it all into Bitcoin. Like that's not the kind of risk I'm talking about. I'm talking about any kind of calculated risk. Make and keep makes it very difficult to invest into your future self. Make and keep is the energy of saving. Make and keep can move into a more sophisticated a situation where you may have a more complex investment strategy, but please understand that what make and keep does is it's a long, slow, steady path that may or may not work out because we're never doing anything to accelerate. We're not hitting anything close to our potential because rather than seeing how do I take calculated risk with the money I have, how do I put some away and invest some in the future? All of it is closed in into that make or keep energy. And so the thinking trap that accompanies the make and keep level is it was a fluke. Another thinking trap that accompanies this level is people will take it from me. Another saying that we love to say on this level is money doesn't grow on trees. We love to say easy come, easy go. Other people, easy come, easy go, right? So, oh, we don't, we have to work hard for our money. There's something very mechanical about the energy of this level. There's a lot of hard work that goes into this level. This is a level that's in some ways will start to incorporate leverage, but in many ways, we're scared to take that risk. I want you to understand make and keep is really important. This is where the skills of money management comes in. This is where we learn to save. This is where we learn to make long-term investments. This is where we learn the language of money. I actually think this is a really important level to have access to But I want you to understand that your relationship with money is fluid and it can continue to grow. And once you have developed acumen and language around money, there's an opportunity to move to a next level. That next level I call attract and manifest. There's all sorts of people online who like to talk about how you can just manifest it through mindset. And let me tell you, there's something I'm sitting here right now speaking to you with a mug that says manifest that shit. It's super powerful. But what makes attracting and manifesting wealth into your life even more powerful is if you combine it with the acumen and the language of make and keep. When you go from that level into attract and manifest, 
Now what gets to happen is we start to see rapid acceleration of that wealth. This thinking trap that we fall into and attract and manifest is easy come, easy come more. Oh, I did it once. I attracted and this is amazing. I'm totally attracting all of this money. Then what happens? We attract a little bit more. Oh my God. You're still like, okay, I'll take that, Megan. That's totally good. And then, and then what happens? Well, we kind of lose a lot. Well, that's okay. It's just your energetic field. What if you could just attract it and know how to manage it, know how to manage that risk and continue to have it grow? So there's two versions of that attract and manifest. There is going to be some work involved in that attract and manifest. It is not simply a mindset state. It is a beautiful yin and yang, the masculine, the feminine of money management, the flow and the mechanism, the flow and the form of money. The positive side of attract and manifest also starts to incorporate some of those tangible tools, some of those tangible languages. It looks at how we start to invest our money. It requires an expansion of uh, that financial acumen. Let's associate now with each of these different levels, some key actions that need to take place to move to the next level. I want to align these actions with something that I need you to start to think about. And this is going to be the second thing that we are going to discuss in relation to your relationship with money. And the second consideration I want you to have past what level is my origin level and what do I need to do to vibrate higher is I want you to acknowledge what game are you playing? What do I mean by what game are you playing? This is where I get, uh, I'm cautionary around, you know, the newspaper investment advice. And the reason I say that is you need to understand what, what level you are at so you know what game you are playing. When you are in the work win windfall, if you immediately want to have money in your life, the immediate action you need to take is you need to start saving and stop spending. Now, if you are hanging out in that attract and manifest and above that level is a, is a layer I call quantum wealth. This is where your ongoing growth around attraction and manifestation and your ongoing growth around making and keeping, meaning financial acumen and your understanding of, of tax structures and investment possibilities are continuing to grow simultaneously. You're benefiting from the from compounding. That's what happens in quantum wealth. That is a different game. The game Warren Buffett is playing is not the game you or I are playing. He's managing billions of dollars. One of the things that made Warren Buffett so successful, he's been investing for 75 years. He is benefiting from compounding over that time. It's not like one or two cool things he's done that make him make better decisions. He's made a decision to keep his money in the market for 75 years. That is going to create an accumulation of of wealth. If you are playing the game of how do I get to the next level from the work win win all stage, you need to stop spending and you need to start saving. You need to collect some of that money. The exact same thing that I told you was a trap in the next level. You have to practice hanging on to it. If you let it go or you are overspending, you mechanically aren't going to be able to move to that next level. You can't manifest yourself out of that situation. Your game is to save and stop spending. That is not the game Warren Buffett is playing. It's not the game. Sometimes I play the game, but that's not the game I'm playing right now with respect to my money. So the mindset piece that I want you to accompany that saving and stop spending is I have the tools to earn more with my gifts and skills, but you need to have that resource available for you to make it happen. I need you to start to shift that belief. I need you to see the money in your bank account. That's going to take tangible actions. Now, the next game, the make and keep game, if you've been hanging on to all of your money, if it's accumulating in your bank account, female entrepreneurs are famous for this. When you we look at how they've deployed money and how they've deployed capital in their business, and I'm going to separate how you manage business in your life and in your business, what we see as a pattern for female entrepreneurs is they tend to hoard money in their businesses, really like intergenerational money stuff going on there, but they're like, they're hoarding. In fact, one of the things we look at, if you look at like a profit first Uh, type model is that often the advice to female entrepreneurs is okay, like stop hoarding, like well done, you've got the save and stop spending, but you're not spending at all. And so your business is actually not going to grow, you're going to get stuck. Because what you need now, now that you've stopped spending is now you need a skill set and a strategy to know where to deploy that investment. 
And then investment usually in that make and keep phase of growing your business or in your life is investment in yourself, investment in yourself. You're going to start with you, you as the leader. This is where like investing in, in masterminds, investing in community where you're starting to think like an entrepreneur and see how entrepreneurs think you're putting yourself in an environment that elevates you. That's what we're talking about when we look at this invest in self. And so this is where I want you to take that mindset piece around like easy come, easy go. Oh my gosh, I can't spend any money to easy come, easy come more, easy come, easy come more, which is the thinking trap of the next level. But it is also what takes you up there. Remember, moving with money is a constant state of growth. So again, what game are you playing? Are you managing how you get out of win, work, windfall? Are you managing how you elevate past, make and keep? At some point, you're going to have to make a decision to put you back into a state of momentum. You're going to have to invest in yourself. Now, there's a third layer of the game. Maybe we're playing this game up here and we're hanging out to this attract and manifest. We're like, how do I make it happen more consistently? How do I make my money grow for me on my behalf, this is where we need to start to invest in caretakers. We need to have make sure that our money is being managed by people who have a high degree of acumen around this. It doesn't mean you don't have acumen around it. It means you also employ people to help you manage your money, to take it to the next level. That's the game you are starting to play. When we look at the game of money, Understanding that different games are being played is critical. It's also critical to giving context to some of the stories and some of the language that you were told as a kid. If you were told money doesn't grow on trees and every time you ask for candy, it was triggering to one of your parents, maybe that's because they were vibrating in that work win windfall. And the action they were taking is stop spending and save. And every time you ask for things, it was extremely triggering for them because they didn't know how to get to that next level. It was beyond their purview. So them saying money doesn't grow on trees or we're not the kind of people with money, maybe that did apply to where you were at when you were six, but does that story apply to you now? Is that the game you are playing now? Is that the game you want to be playing in five years? The way a day trader invests is entirely different than someone who's managing the money of a 40-year-old with disposable income. That 40-year-old is looking at where that investment's going to be for them in 35, 40 years. That day trader is looking at where that investment is going to be in three or four hours. They're playing entirely different games. That day trader can afford to buy a stock that is near its highest point if they are betting it's going to go even higher in the next four hours. For the person managing your portfolio, the last thing you want them to do is buy an Apple stock today. So understanding the game you are playing, the level you are at, requires your honesty. If you are still hanging out in the work, win, windfall energy, then you need to acknowledge the behavior that is going to accompany that, that is going to accompany your growth. Stop spending, start saving. That is where you start to see the nuance in financial advice. That's where you stop being like, well, someone just tell me like the be all and end all. Well, it starts with understanding your level and it starts with understanding the game you are playing. Let's move on to the third thing we can do to start to shift your relationship with money. And that is acknowledge your current money situation, not just what vibrational level you're hanging at. Cause that's kind of fun. Like once you're like, Oh, huge relief. I'm in the, I'm in the work windfall phase. Oof, glad we acknowledge that. Next thing I want you to do is I want you to open up all your bank accounts and legitimately acknowledge where things are at. Where are you hanging on to credit card debt, for example? Where are you overspending? What are you spending your money on every month? Do you need it? Or are you just taking a dopamine hit? I need you to just be ruthlessly honest with yourself. It's going to be very hard to move you to that next level if you're keeping secrets from yourself because you're managing that shame. The fastest way to move out of that shame box at the bottom is to just lay it all on the table, to just see what you're actually working with. The same way you would encourage for all my practitioners out there, your patients to lay it on the table so they know what they're working with. You've got to unlock you and move you up. You have this potential, but you've got to know what you're working with. Number three, acknowledge your current money situation. What beliefs do you have? What is this triggering for you? What is this bringing up? What stories are you remembering as you're staring at these numbers? The next question for you is, are they in fact true? Number four, let's get really clear on what you want to earn and why do you want to earn it? 
once you actually see your, I have lots of people who come to me and they're like, Megan, or I hear through the grapevine, this is my favorite. I uh, heard through the grapevine that uh, you love to talk to practitioners uh, about money and, and um, I don't, I don't buy into all of that. I like, I don't understand why people need more than $70,000 a year. I don't understand why anyone needs more than $100,000 a year. There's a righteousness to that money piece. And some of you might be triggered into that right now. When I ask you what you need to earn and what you want to earn, if you find yourself moving into a story of righteousness when you're asked that question or when you hear someone else has been asked that question and need you to just stop dead in your tracks and acknowledge where that is coming from. See, the thing about money is, is that when you believe that money can be a force for good, uh, we know when we look at social determinants of health that one's uh, financial status is probably the strongest indicator of their ability to achieve outcomes. It blows my mind away when healthcare providers want to, like, in a mindset way, deny themselves access to more money. The number one thing that determines health, they're getting really righteous about. So you having money doesn't mean someone else doesn't get to have money. In fact, you having money resources you to be more creative in how you can reach more people. So if you don't have a handle on these pieces, it's really hard for you to build up. Other people have a handle on these. And it doesn't matter how much someone is earning. I have sat with lawyers making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in my office sobbing because they don't know how to manage their money. They don't know how to pay for their retirement. Their biggest source and stress in life is that they haven't told their wife they don't actually have as much money as they thought. So I really need everyone to have a deep look at this because this is a huge source of ill health for a lot of people. And moving into a state of righteousness will not fix that for anyone. So what do you need? You're going to know what you need because you look at all of those expenses and you're like, wow, this is how much I spend. And you're going to need some room to have a little bit of fun in your life. So like, don't, don't restrict yourself. Be honest. What do you need to live? And then what do you want to earn? What would you love to do? What experiences would you love to facilitate for your children or for your family or for your parents who gave so much up for you to be where you're at? Like, if you're really honest, what would you like to earn until you put that number down and you have a look at it you're not going to be able to build a lifestyle or a business of contribution that can get you there and i really believe in that we can build a business that has massive impact and contribution in the world but we have to be really clear on what we want it to earn until i started to be very clear on what i want my business to earn on a monthly basis i was just doing stuff and i was getting really tired and then when i was like holy smokes i actually really need to earn that because i'm supporting three kids and my husband, whose business is like launching, that was a lot of responsibility. It was like a lot of responsibility, just acknowledging how much money that would take, how much money that would take and be able to continue to provide them with the experiences that they're deriving a great deal of meaning from. So our numbers will all be different. We're all playing a different game here. But the lens that I don't want you to approach this with is one of righteousness, because it's actually a symptom of that shame piece. So the more scarcity we have, the more righteous we tend to be around that money piece. And I want to call that out in the loving spirit of abundance that I want all practitioners and all entrepreneurs to have access to. You can desperately want to help people in the world and be filthy rich at the same time. And guess what? You are going to be so creative in your philanthropy of how you reach more people with your incredible skill set and tools that I promise at some point you will be thanking me. So what do you need and what do you want to earn? Because there's going to be a vibration around the acknowledgement of both of those pieces. Number five, I realize I misnumbered things. We actually have seven. Number five, where are you leaking money? So when you look at those bank statements, when you look at those credit card statements, if you've got a business, open it up in your business and open it up in your life. If you've never looked at your family's finances, what a great opportunity you are about to have. Where are you leaking money? I'll tell you where I leak money. I leak money all the time with Uber Eats. That is a huge problem. I leak money all the time because I'm too lazy to plan my meals sometimes. And we just buy a whole bunch of food and hope for the best. And then it doesn't all fit together. And I don't like throwing food out. So we have these like compromised meals and we've overspent on groceries. I know that I definitely leak money there. I know sometimes it's just a little bit easy to order things on Amazon that I kind of maybe don't really need, or I could creatively leverage something at home. These are all easy money leaks that I can patch up. I realized we were spending like $1,200 on Uber Eats a month at one point. And I said a month, meaning more than one month. 
in 2022. That is like really leaky. And yes, we could justify it because we're busy and we have stuff going on. We can also tighten that up. There's probably other systems that we can put in play that achieve a better outcome for all of us. Where are you leaking money? Number six, I want you to start to categorize money myths and money curriculum that has been handed down to you from your family. This is the core money curriculum that would have happened at your layer of money origin. So if you grew up in that wind, work, windfall household, you probably heard a lot of times that money doesn't grow on trees. If you grew up in that make and keep uh, family, you were probably told an awful lot to save and hang on to your pennies. If you grew up in a household where there was like constant talk of manifestation, but you didn't have context around that, you may be lacking some of the systems that you need to actually start to build wealth. So what I want you to do is I want you to start to categorize and inventory some of the money myths and curriculum that have been handed down to you. I grew up in a family where we talked very openly about money. We talked about tools of wealth building, how to invest money, how to pick stocks, how to build businesses. Like I was so fortunate. One thing we never talked about was the energetics of money. And that capped me. It kept me like hanging out in this like masculine state of money management. It also meant that I shut off and didn't even know that I could actually change my mindset around what was possible with money. Every decision, every benchmark, every like launch goal, everything I did was like extremely prudent because that's how I was taught to manage money from a place of like prudence and responsibility. But when the first time I said to myself, what if instead of 150 people buying a program, we put 1500 people in it? What has to be true for that to happen? And I, I aligned my action with that and I manifested and thought about that potential. We did it. And we didn't do it every time, but we were able to achieve it. We were able to unlock what is possible. I want you to start to categorize the money myths. What were you told? And you can do this in three columns. What were you told? Yes or no? Like, is it true? Is that true? And likely it's like, yes, and there's a nuance to it or no, and, but is it true? And then I want you to have a category for alternative possibilities. Honey doesn't grow on trees, but what if I could imagine what I want and reverse engineer it nine times out of 10? Well, that's even better. So I want you to create an alternative possibility, but I want you to be positive. I want it to be positive and solution oriented. If all we see is problems, we are very good at making them. So Category number three, column number three, that alternative possibility, that is for all of the areas where we have to rewrite the story. What is the more empowering possibility? Lastly, number seven, I want you to spend a little bit of time acknowledging and leaning into how you would describe your new relationship with money. And I started to write a few notes here. I started to like jot down a few ideas around money. The question I really wanted to ask here is what would you be willing to do for money as if it was a partner for you in your life? And that's really how I view money for myself. I view money as a partner. And when suddenly I look up and I'm like, ah, it's not as much coming in. Like, what have I been doing with my energy or my thoughts or my actions that have been interrupting that? And if I think of money as a partner with compassion, it changes everything about those stories. I want you to imagine, I think we've probably all had this experience where we were like super into a relationship and either us or the other person broke it off. You know, that like desperate state of like, oh my gosh, I will do every anything to have them back that like, ugh, like you just confront all of these things. You're like, I will totally change my behavior. Oh my gosh, I've been being such a tool. Like we just rapidly accelerate the realization of our own behaviors and and what that relationship meant to us. You know that like that phase and in some cases we moved on, but that doesn't help my analogy here. I want you to pretend you want that person and that partner back. That's the energy I want you to approach this exercise with. And as I was preparing this conversation and I always just jot down notes and then see where we we are we flow, what I realized uh, quickly happened is that I ended up writing like what amounts to a love note to money. And I want to share with you some of the things that just came up for me, like in a flow state, when I decided to put language to this idea of treating money as if it was a partner that I wanted to have back and not just want to have back, but like want to recommit 
to building an amazing future together with. I wrote down, I want to hang on to you. I want to make room for you to grow. I wrote down, I want to see the best in you. I wrote down that I don't want to make assumptions based on small amounts of evidence. Doesn't this sound like any relationship? I don't want to make assumptions based on small amounts of evidence. I want to see your potential and not bring past trauma into the relationship. I'm talking about money, not your partner here. I want to see your potential and not bring past trauma into the relationship. I commit to working on my own past trauma. I want to set you up for growth. I want to stop the behavior on my part that is sabotaging your success. I want to see your soul. I want to acknowledge that you can be used for good or for evil, but create a home where your power is put to good use. I will not use you to elevate my own status. Self-esteem and worthiness are an inside job, and I am willing to do the work. I love you. I want you in my life. Not just today, not for a fling, but in a long, lasting, and meaningful way. If you want to borrow this to get that guy back, you are welcome to. But I, more than anything, want you to use this as a mindset tool, as a trigger for you to be able to start to shift your relationship with money, the power of money. If you approached this, these words, if I'd approached this exercise from a place of righteousness, my words would have been totally different. It would have been all their fault. I want you to approach this last exercise. What amounts to a love letter to money from truly that place of compassion, from that place of response ability, the responsibility you get to take to move your relationship with money to the next level. You have been told all sorts of stories. We all have. You have been given all sorts of good skills and bad skills when it comes to managing money, just like that is true for relationships. But this is the moment where you are going to get to start to shift that relationship with money simply for you. This is part of that work for self-worth. This is part of that inside job. And this is part of unlocking your potential. So I want to leave you with that this week. I want to give this to you as homework. But I also want to make sure that as we are talking about that mindset piece, as we are talking really here about attracting and manifesting, this is this is work that exists at that level but is open for anyone to participate in. It will change as you move up the rung of those different financial vibrational states. I want you to know what makes this work really helpful is if we root it in tangible action. And so what I'm going to do next week on the podcast is I want to talk to specifically the coaches and the practitioners and those people who facilitate a transformational shift in others. You could be a life coach. You could be a money coach. You could be uh, a naturopathic doctor, a functional medicine doc. I don't really care. You deliver transformation. I'm going to be talking to you. And what I'm going to talk to you about is how to move from delivering transactional experiences to transformational experiences. This is going to be practical and tangible because when we move from transaction to transformational, what we really are looking at is a six-fold increase in outcome for the people we work with and income for ourselves. So we're going to talk about the tenets of a transformational program. I want to give you that blueprint so you have an idea of how to take these manifesting pieces and then actually see a potential reality that you can take yourself to the next level. When you build a transformational program, you can charge more for it. We're going to literally create the framework for you to have a tool that can help move you to that next place. We're going to be doing that together next Tuesday back here on the Impact Podcast. I am Megan Walker. I love this stuff. I can't wait to help you change more lives, have more impact, and put more money in your pocket along the way. I'll see you back here next Tuesday for that. Impact is what lives on when we leave the room, tuck them in, or step off stage. It is less about what you do, more about how you make them feel, and everything about how you choose to show up in the world. If you enjoyed this podcast, hit subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you are listening to this episode. I am your host, Megan Walker. Until next week, aim for impact.